Hey, uh, I decided to, to look at that communication that's, that's flowing between the client and the, uh, and the firewall and see exactly what, what, uh, you know, how, that, how that exchange is performed. Um, what we see here is a screenshot from, uh, from Burp Suite where we're, um, we're proxying and re, uh, renegotiating the SSL session. Um, so we've got two SSL streams, one between this, uh, this Burp machine and the ASA and the other between the Burp, you know, the, uh, Burp machine and the client. Uh, so this allows us to see the contents of the HTTPS stream that would otherwise uh, be encrypted and, uh, and not visible to us. Um, if you look through here, you can start to get an idea for the command flow. Um, the first few uh, lines there are downloading some of the, uh, the Java components, uh, the jar files and, and you know, JNLP files. Um, further on, we see, uh, we see the client software after it starts up, check the version of the ASA so it knows what commands are supported and, and how, it can, uh, how it can talk to it. And then the, uh, the session that's highlighted here um, shows the first authenticated session. Uh, so this is after after the administrators entered their username and password and connected, uh, you know, under, with administrative credentials. Um, what's interesting here, if you look at the details uh, down at the bottom, it's using uh, HTTP Basic Auth. Um, so all that really does um, is is Base64 encode your username and password. Um, it's pretty pretty weak way to protect administrative credentials. Uh, it, you know, it is generally over S, uh, SSL, but as we'll see, um, you know, there's, there's ways to defeat, uh, defeat that protection, uh, and there's no further protection from the application. Um, so just a, a, a summary of the different URLs that, uh, that ASDM uses to communicate with the firewall. Um, we've got an admin directory, uh, as well as an admin public directory, uh, which basically store the, uh, the, the Java files and the helper files that are given to the client. Uh, these are, um, are accessible anonymously. They're, they're basically public uh, directories. Uh, our remaining directories all require authentication, uh, and this is always done with HTTP basic auth. Every authenticated request has your username and password. Um, so there's, there's basically three different, uh, different paths that are, are of interest to us. Um, the first is the slash admin slash exec. Uh, this allows us to execute commands uh, by sending the command text in the URI of the request. Um, admin config returns the current running configuration of the firewall. Uh, then admin capture will allow us to, uh, to view any packet, uh, packet captures that we've configured on the firewall. Uh, and you can also get those in PCAP format by, uh, by appending PCAP. So down at the bottom of the slide here, we've got some examples of running the shover command um, you notice that the space is HTTP encoded. Um, you can run any command that you can run on the command line by just appending it to the slash exec URL. Um, so um, let's see. Then uh, the next example there is showing, uh, showing the download of a PCAP file for the capture name test. Um, the next uh, example there shows uh, a command that's going to return the, the current clock, the time on the device, uh, as well as the contents of the inside access list. Um, now, in that example, you'll notice that we've chained two commands together. Uh, you can do this uh, pretty, you know, at a pretty good amount of depth. I actually haven't found a maximum number of commands that you could chain together that way. Uh, so as long as you, uh, you know, HTTP encode your spaces and, spe you know, any special characters that are present, um, you can chain uh, as many arbitrary commands as you'd like into, uh, into a single GET request. Um, as I mentioned, um, we're using HTTP basic auth for... Uh, for authentication, um, so our credentials are, are just Base64 encoded. So in the example I had previously, this, this YWR is the Base64 string, uh, and as you can see, that that Base64 decodes to admin colon super secret, uh, which is our username and password, uh, you know, separated by colon. Um, so the obvious uh, the obvious weakness here is that if we use an SSL interception proxy uh, like Burp, Paros, uh, you know, any any number of uh, of of those uh, web scarab, um, you can rewrite, uh, you know, re-encrypt, uh, decrypt and re-encrypt the session uh, and man in the middle it. Uh, this would require that you would, you would send a different certificate to the client since you uh, don't have access to the, the private key that the ASA is using. Um, so it, it is easily detectable. Um, however, I, I found that oftentimes uh, people don't, you know, pe people will run self-signed certificates on their ASAs. 
Um, you know, there's generally a, a fairly small user base, uh, often as few as you know one or two administrators that are going to be using the, uh, using that. Um, so, you know, companies that don't maintain their own certificate authority don't want to go out and pay for a certificate. Um, so they'll just use self-signed certs. With that being the case, um, you know, oftentimes uh, administrators become complacent about the uh, about the SSL warnings and, and may just click right through. Um, so uh, the next way that you can leverage this weakness is through uh, cross-site request forgery. Um, you know, as, as we discussed, you can, you can append any command you want into the URL. Uh, there's no nonsing, there's no randomization of the URL. Uh, it's just slash exec slash command. So, um, you know, there's, there's nothing protecting us from cross-site request forgery. Uh, there's no hashing of the URIs uh, in your authentication credentials as digest auth might, might, uh, might do. So uh, there's basically nothing protecting the integrity of, uh, of the URL um, in that request. Um, although to exploit cross-site request forgery, uh, the client would have to have hit the ASA through a browser and authenticated. Um, this isn't something that's done uh, frequently. Uh, most people will navigate to it, uh, download the Java uh, client, and then authenticate through Java. Uh, so the browser may not uh, have cache credentials often since, since those credentials aren't generally given to the browser. Um, but if an admin user uh, browses, you know, using a, a normal web browser, uh, the browser will cache those credentials. Uh, there's no logout mechanism. There's no age out or timeout. Uh, as long as the uh, you know that browser uh, process is running, uh, those credentials are going to be cached on the client. Um, so there's actually a few cases where Cisco recommends you use the browser to connect to your ASA. Um, you know, as I said, this isn't this isn't something that's done real frequently. Um, but there's a, there's some corner cases where it's where it's recommended. Um, you know, it's, re, it's the recommended way to access the ASA. Um, one of these is for copying packet captures off the sensor. Um, you know, it can be a heck of a lot easier than, than copying it over FTP or SCP. Uh, you know, to just pull up that URL. But as soon as you enter those credentials, uh, that browser session's got them. Um, Another uh, example of a, a place where they recommend uh, connecting through the browser is in pre-shared key recovery. Uh, as Ben mentioned, um, you know the ASA will have uh, you know access to pre-shared keys of any IPsec VPNs that are uh, that are configured on it. Um, Cisco generally does not allow the administrator to see those keys. Uh, if you run a show run command on the uh, the command line, uh, instead of your pre-shared key, you're going to see a series of stars. Uh, this is despite being an authorized administrator over an encrypted session. Uh, so they have an article out there that, uh, that explains some ways to recover those keys in the event that they're lost and you need to, uh, need to replicate them. Um, this is kind of an interesting article. The first, the first method that they recommend is to use, uh, use the more command on the command line to process your, your system configuration. So basically by not going through the show command, uh, that masking is, is bypassed. Um, Cisco has kind of changed their, their tune on this. Uh, they're saying now that this is a bug. Uh, so they've got one article that says uh, this can be a way to recover pre-shared keys. Uh, and then they've got a bug saying, yeah, what we told you to do in that other article, uh, that's, that's bug behavior. Uh, so the release notes for 8.3.1 um, you know, state that that's, that that's been fixed uh, and no longer works. Uh, I haven't actually confirmed that, but that's from the release notes. Uh, the other ways to get pre-shared key recovery are also kind of interesting. Um, the next two are to copy it over TFTP or FTP. Uh, the thing that strikes me as odd about this is that the whole reason you need to do this is because they won't show you the pre-shared keys over an encrypted SSH session when you're authorized, um, but they suggest that you send them over TFTP or FTP, which are plain text protocols. Um, I kind of don't understand how those two, uh, you know, those, those two stances um, can be resolved with each other. Uh, if pre-shared keys are so sensitive that we don't want to show them over an encrypted channel for risk of uh, interception, why would we want to send them over plain text? Mm -hmm. um, and then their last option is to copy or download the config via HTTPS uh, just by connecting to the browser, you know, your browser to the ASA with the slash config directory. Um, and that, that option will uh, make your browser susceptible to cross-site request forgery. Uh, there's really, there's really, you know, each of these uh, methods that they describe in this article uh, are inherently flawed, um, but they're, they're recommended methods. Um, so another way that you can exploit these, uh, these weaknesses is through, uh, 
the SSL renegotiation vulnerability that was discovered uh, in November. Um, this vulnerability was discovered by uh, Marsh Ray and Steve Dispenza of Phone Factor. Um, it affects pretty much, uh, in fact, I'm not aware of any SSL implementation that wasn't affected. Um, it, it's it's a, a protocol design flaw, not, a, not an implementation flaw. Uh, so Cisco's far from alone in being uh, impacted by this. Um, there's a lot that can be said about that bug, but the, the short version of it is that uh, a man in the middle can ask both endpoints to renegotiate their encryption settings. Uh, and during that process, there's a time when they can send plain text to the server, uh, and the server will accept that and then prepend it to the request that's received encrypted from the client. Um, so what that allows us to do is inject uh, text into uh, an SSL and se uh, encrypted session. Uh, there's no way to decrypt uh, data, you can't view what's going on, uh, but you can inject uh, arbitrary plain text at the beginning of a request. Um, combined with the weak authentication mechanisms that are, that are inherent in, uh, in ASA and ASDM's architecture, um, you can inject a URI at the beginning of the packet. Um, the next slide here demonstrates, oops, actually there's one more before that. Um, yeah, so Cisco published uh, a security advisory rapidly after the, uh, the renegotiation vulnerability was discovered. Uh, they have one security advisory uh, covering their response uh, to this issue across all, um, all of their products. Uh, obviously, they had quite a few products that were uh, affected. Um, they also have uh, individual bugs tracking each individual product, uh, and they have bugs for ASA and ASDM, uh, and there's the bug IDs up there. Uh, the, the problem here is that these aren't very detailed bugs, uh, and the security advisory is, is uh, kind of by its nature um, a little bit vague since it's meant to apply to uh, everything that Cisco produces. Um, basically, they, they include the text, uh, the impact of an attack depends on the application protocol running over TLS. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty broad statement. Um, you know, in, in my mind, uh, the impact uh, specifically against ASDM uh, is that an attacker can insert any arbitrary commands and take over the firewall. Uh, they can insert commands uh, in the context of your authorized administrative session uh, and, and do basically anything they want as if they were on the CLI. Um, so here's, here's kind of an example of how this works. Uh, at the top here we see our original request sent by the client. Um, and you can see it's just running a show version and some other show commands. Um, it's not actually uh, doing anything that, that would modify the configuration. Um, and again, we see our, our friendly little uh, HTTP basic auth. Uh, so then the next section there is the, uh, you know, an example of text that an attacker might want to inject into this session. Uh, so the attacker is basically injecting uh, another Git request uh, that says, you know, to create a name record uh, associating the IP 1111 with the, with the name pwned. Uh, you could basically do anything you wanted. You could create a username. You could, uh, you know, clearly config, um, you know, open up uh, modify access list to allow yourself access to other, uh, other hosts that you're not supposed to have. Uh, and then you'll see there's a, a new line uh, followed by this xignore, uh, and there's no new line following the, the xignore. Um, so the effect is when the uh, attacker's text is prepended to the um, to the actual client request, uh, we get something that looks like the like the final request here. Uh, we have the attacker supplied get command, uh, and that xignore uh, causes the the true client's uh, client initiated request to be ignored by the firewall. Uh, you'll notice that the HTTP basic auth header is still there. Um, so. You know, we still have those valid, legitimate credentials that the uh, that the client provided us, um, and so that's that's basically how uh, how this would be exploited. Um, so there is proof of concept code for the TLS SSL renegotiation vulnerability. Um, it was released by uh, a group called Red Team Pen Testing out of Germany. Uh, it's up on their site as well as on Exploit DB. Uh, it does require some some modifications to uh, to work with uh, with ASDM, and I, I've actually. Uh, had some some uh, some issues trying to get it working with ASDM. Um, first of all, we would need to skip the first uh, first several requests um, since there's you know some initial uh, setup in downloading files and, and those initial requests don't have the authentication credentials that that are what we're really after. Um, I also noticed that the uh, the connection handling on this uh, this proof of concept script was in in my testing a little strange. Uh, when the server would send a fan or a reset packet. Uh, that wasn't being passed through to the client, so the client would basically sit there and, and wait forever uh, 
you know, it, it, it's not a problem when there's only one session, one, uh, one connection, but uh, something like ASDM firing off uh, connections, rapid fire, um, you know, that could be a, a big problem.